Hey guys, Matt here, riding the Burmese Railway up to an area called the Hellfire Pass. This is part two of a two-part series about this area, in particular the railroad. The area we're headed to right now, called Hellfire Pass, has a, has a particularly gruesome story, but I think it's important that we remember our past so we don't ever repeat it. By the way, hi, my name's Matt. I'm cycling around the world on a recumbent trike. Please subscribe to this channel if you want to follow me around the world. And then you can go to this link right here. You can see my path I intend to ride as I make my way from China all the way to the United States. This is the Burma Railway. It's also called the Death Railway. It was built by the Japanese during their campaign on Burma. They were trying to supply the Burmese operation with goods while avoiding the ocean route because as soon as they took that ocean route, they were just getting bombed incessantly. So they were losing supplies almost more than they could uh, resupply. So they had the idea to build a railroad from basically Bangkok to Rangoon. The problem was that it has some of the most treacherous and mountainous and jungle infested terrain that you could plot a railroad through, especially when you didn't have access to the technology we have today. The only thing they did have plentiful of was manpower, and they put it to some brutal, brutal use. Once the railroad fell into Allied hands, the, the British had it shut down. Uh, it reopened a little bit on the stretch that we're riding right now, but the actual linkage from Bangkok to Rangoon doesn't go anymore. Almost a quarter of a million people, soldiers, POWs, toiled to build this railroad. And they did it in record time. They built 415 kilometers worth of railway with 600 bridges over the course of one year and one month. That is a testament to human perseverance and engineering and torture. Okay, we're off the train. We've arrived at Tamkarase. I think you pronounce it that way, Tamkarase. I've got to find my driver and then we'll head to the Hellfire Pass. History is kind of like a set of those prescription glasses that tint in the sunlight. The sunlight is time, and as time passes, the sun causes the uh, glasses to darken, and so history starts to get a little bit more opaque. Only when you go to these places and you set foot here, and you, you can see the walls that have been blasted by all the POWs, and set foot on the tracks that were laid by so many prisoner soldiers, that you really get an appreciation for the place. But even then, it's almost like you're walking through a theme park rather than such a torturous uh, event in human history. Time. Time changes things, and it's a positive too, you know. We can move away from the dark spots in history and move towards the brighter ones. And hopefully down the road we don't have somebody walking down some sort of treacherous area saying, you know, if those guys in 2019 had only known that I would be walking here telling their story and their struggle, that really was completely unnecessary. I guess it's inevitable, right? I guess it's inevitable. Everybody's gonna learn their own lessons. 
So when the Japanese took Singapore fairly easily, they walked away with about 100,000 POWs. And the Japanese told them that they were going to be taken to a, uh, a prison camp, but they were going to be treated well under the Gene Geneva Convention and, and everything was going to be okay. And they said, we got this really great idea, you know, this really great place, we're going to take you up, you're going to work up in Thailand. So they trained them and they boated them all the way up to this area here. Uh, it was a pretty brutal way to go. Uh, the trains were extremely cramped and the, and the boats were being bombed. But when they got here, they were told that oh, it's going to be pretty easy. And they were dropped off in areas a lot like this. Maybe not with the automobile and the technology today, but there was villages and towns. And there wasn't a lot of Japanese soldiers kind of in this area in the very beginning. As a matter of fact, when the first group of uh, prisoners came, they were relaxed. They started selling a bunch of their stuff to the local vendors for food and supplies. And they were like, okay, okay, I can get used to this. Uh, as soon as the Japanese arrived, it took them a couple of weeks to round everybody up. And when they did, they got a stark reality that their life wasn't going to be quite so comfortable. But for a little while, they thought, maybe, just maybe, being a POW under the Japanese Empire rule wasn't going to be so bad. Little did they know. Okay? Hey. Okay. One. Nang. Yeah, yeah, I can go there. It's okay. Thank you. I got this whole car to myself. I should start picking up uh, passengers and splitting it with the, with the driver. <laughs> Maybe I can make money on this uh, little, little excursion. If you were a POW here working at one of the camps, the perimeter of the camp was guarded lightly. You could escape, I guess, fairly easily. But if you did escape, uh, you only escaped into the jungle. Disease, starvation, dehydration, all of these things were waiting for you outside of the camp. So you kind of had to choose your fate. Now I'm riding in a taxi on a, on a nicely paved road. Sometimes I visualize what a war would look like today, a similar type of war. Get to the McDonald's, get to the McDonald's, get to the McDonald's. I'm at Starbucks, I'm at Starbucks. Send reinforcements to Starbucks. Grab me a vente while you're coming. To give you guys a little perspective, these are the train cars that uh, took uh, POWs to the camps. Now, I don't know if you can tell, but they are very small. And I used to cram like 40 POWs in here as they progressed from uh, Singapore over to uh, the job site. Just enough headroom in the center, but on the sides. And they're, whew, they probably got hot in here. Probably got miserable. They'd close the doors, you'd have a little vent here. Get some sort of ventilation. Crazy. So this is the Hellfire Pass. Men were swinging hammers onto uh, uh, chisels that were being buried into the, into the rock, just enough for dynamite to be put in and then broken apart. And then rubble like this was being pushed off the edge or put wherever they could. The reason this is called Hellfire Pass is that the Japanese were really hurried to get this finished. And so they worked people through the night. Sometimes they'd have 20 plus hour shifts, 30 hour shifts, and people would be working and toiling in this chasm through the night. The edges of the chasm were lit with torchlight and the men had torches and they were sweating, wearing loincloths. Their clothes were in tatters to the extent to where their boots had melted away. Their clothes had just disintegrated. They were wearing the bare necessities of clothing and sweating. Their Japanese uh, captors were positioned in places to, to, to just shout and yell orders, 
keep it going, keep it going, keep it going. Don't stop. If you stopped, you were tortured, you were beat. It was a hellscape and fire and brimstone, you know? So if, if you were to imagine uh, the hellish landscape, this, this would have been it. So that's kind of why they nicknamed this place Hellfire, Hellfire Pass. I just shuffled over some rock here, over the pass. So I just went over the pass. There's actually a trail on the other side, but I made my own trail. It was, this, this section is actually quite small. The whole Hellfire Pass area seems smaller than I expected. I uh, stepped on a rock and I, I cut my foot. Just a little cut, a little cut. It's bleeding though. It made me think, you know, that could have spelled an amputation, death, infection, bacteria, I mean, if you were here in 1942 and 43 during the construction of this railroad and you got a cut on your foot and I, I'm wearing shoes, they were, they were barefoot, you know, you get a bad enough cut, you get an ulcer, that sore grows. I never cease to be amazed at human potential. We can do such amazing things when pressure is applied. Unfortunately, there's a lot of times in history where the pressure was applied for nefarious or evil or greedy reasons. My hope is that we can kind of come together under a positive pressure and that we can do some amazing things. I recently heard the story about our plan to go to the moon and send a couple of people up there for two weeks. That's that's the good stuff. That's the kind of story I like to hear. Positive pressure applied, creating some truly impressive results that will actually make us look back on, on our time and say, I'm proud, I'm proud, you know? Anyways, walking tail, trail closure. This is the area, this is the area behind the Hellfire Pass. I was thinking maybe we could walk around. Um, it is interesting to walk this stretch because this is a little bit more I don't know how they put a train in this area. It's crazy. It's crazy. That, that train ride must have been rickety. Anyways, I guess this is as far as we can go. Can anybody tell me what these are? This is the first time I've been able to see one of these plants or growths or whatever. Um, head height. Normally they're way, way up in the canopies. I saw them in Laos and uh, Cambodia when I was cycling through. Actually, I found uh, one of these when I was cycling to see uh, if I could find my friend uh, Adam's drone in Cambodia just before I got to Thailand. They don't seem to be part of the tree. They seem to be like a growth or a fungus. What are these things? The leaves are soft like a dog's ear they feel like a dog's ear oh hitchhiker now after the war when the Allied forces kind of took control of this area, the first thing they did was close it down. They actually had the Japanese prisoners of war disassemble two kilometers of it. I just, you guys worked so hard to put it together. You lost, tear it down. I think it had a little bit to do with the British wanting to maintain the shipping routes from Singapore. And this rail, railway sort of threatened that and so they, they shut it down. When they opened it up, they stopped it right up the way. It continues, or it continued uh, for a few hundred kilometers until it got to uh, Rangoon in Burma. They, uh, they never opened up that section again. If you are uh, 
so inclined and you like this video, you'd like to see more as I cycle around the world from China to the United States through a hundred countries on a recumbent trike, and, uh, subscribe to my channel and hit that little notification bar. Bell. Bell. <laughs> if you would like to know what life is like as a traveler doing such a thing as me on more of a intimate level, then uh, help me out on my tour and join my Patreon. There I produce and uh, deliver a uh, 10 minute audio podcast about life, filming, the road, the toils, the challenges and the successes. Yeah, you can be happy knowing that you've helped a fellow traveler achieve his dreams. Anyways, take it easy guys and I will catch you later. Now this is the Burma Railway. It's also called the Death Railway. It's a stretch of railroad that runs 415 kilometers between Ban Pong, Thailand and Dan... <laughs> Dan Bui... Dan Bai Yu Zayat. Dan Bai Yu Zayat? Burma. They built this entire rail... They built this entire... <laughs> Shit.